Hi there. Welcome to the Photo Flunky Show, episode number 81. Today, we're going to be talking about how to take tack sharp photos with your DSLR. Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. We really appreciate you. My name is William Beam. Hi, my name is Lee Beam. And we're going to get to the tax sharp photos. But first, a couple of housekeeping notes. The show notes for this episode are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 81. And there'll be a transcript of the show there for free. Of course, you can find links to subscribe there. Or you can go to photoflunky.com that has a player there with this show and all the others, plus some links to subscribe. And also, I wanted to mention, I've got a free ebook for you. If you're into portrait photography, it's called Creative Portraits. And this is more about the emotional and creative side rather than the technical side of portrait photography. So it's free. You can share it with your friends. You can go to williambeam.com slash free book. Or if you're on your phone, go ahead and text the phrase CP book to the number 33444. All right. So the idea with tack sharp photos is not necessarily that the entire photo is tack sharp. If you want to shoot with a defocused background and have some bokeh, that's fine. But your subject has got to be sharp and it's got to be not just kind of, you know, visible, it's got to be sharp. So if you're going to focus on just the eye of your model, maybe a newborn, maybe a dog, something that you where you want to draw attention, it needs to be sharp. And the phrase tack sharp is enough that, I don't know, I guess is the photos are supposed to hurt you. We've got a few tips over here. And the first one is probably one of the most obvious is watch your shutter speed. For most cases, you're probably going to want to have a shutter speed of at least one one twenty fifth of a second. But I would say the higher, the better. What you're really doing is you're trying to eliminate the need for any vibration or shake to get inside of there. That's why you, you really want to have a nice fast shutter if possible. If you're shooting outdoor in, in nice daylight, you're probably going to be up at like over a thousandth of a second. A nice fast shutter speed is probably the first thing that you can do to help get you a tack sharp result. The reason is not only is it trying to help eliminate your shake, but if you've got a subject that's you know, prone to movement, you want to freeze that image. But everybody moves. I mean, you're breathing. You don't realize how much you move. You take a long exposure, go and stand in front, set the tripod, set the camera on the tripod, go and stand in front of it and, you know, set it for two seconds. You see how much you move in those two seconds, even when you think you're standing still. We move. Photographers move and so do our subjects. It doesn't matter if you've got a person out there or something is flapping in the breeze. You know, if you want to freeze that image and get a really tack sharp image, you just need to watch your shutter speed. The next thing is... Every lens kind of has an aperture setting that is the sweet spot for sharpness. And a lot of these are going to be probably towards the middle range. In other words, if you're shooting wide open, and that could be f2.8, it could be f1.4, f1.8. Some lenses, it might be even f3.5, you know. Whatever the minimum shutter or aperture is of your lens, that is likely not the sharpest spot. It's not going through the center where it's really optimized. There Maybe a couple of exceptions. My Nikon 35 millimeter prime seems to be pretty sharp no matter where I shoot it. But if you really are looking for that sharpness, you may need to sacrifice some of that bokeh in order to get the aperture setting that gives you the absolute sharpness. All right, our third item on the list is kind of, we're recommending that you don't use a high ISO. I don't like highest ISO. I'll try everything else. That is my last resort. And it's it, when I hit ISO, it's desperation. Yeah, high ISO is when you need to get a shot, not necessarily when you need to get the shot. And what we're suggesting here is you're going to get noise and grain and interference, basically, that's going to take away from the sharpness of your photo. When you're seeing noise in there, you're not seeing detail. And the light is weird. Sometimes the color is weird with ISO. I don't know, something strange happens to the temperature as well. A high ISO is going to actually rob you of detail in your photo, which means it's really not going to be tack sharp. Number four is eliminating your human touch and just put it on a tripod and use a shutter release because your hands are going to shake. Even though you may not perceive it, your hands are constantly vibrating. And even for that short duration of the shutter speed that you've got, if it's 125th of a second, you're moving. Well, the press and release as well, when you press, it kind of leans the camera down slightly. And when you release it, it bounces back up in your hand. It's so slight, you don't notice it, but it it's visible in the the sharpness of the photos. One of the places where we notice is like fireworks photos. You know, we can have it on a tripod, but one time Lee and I went out to shoot fireworks and she had her cable release and I didn't. We're both on a tripod, but the fact that I had to go touch my camera meant that as every time I touched the, the shutter button, I was shaking that camera, even though it was on a nice stable platform. Getting a uh, cable release on a tripod really does help limit that. You could also use a timer if you don't have a shutter release, but basically the idea is avoid touching the camera with your hands. 
The fifth one on here, this is one of my suggestions is use a flash. And the reason I suggest that is because the duration of the flash is going to be shorter than your shutter speed. So we talk about, you know, one twenty-fifth, or excuse me, one one hundredth of the twenty-fifth of a second, one two fiftieth or whatever. Flash speed at the slowest probably one fifteen hundredth of a second. It is going to be shorter than your shutter duration in many cases. And it's really the amount of light that falls on your subject that's kind of controlling what comes up back on your sensor. So if the light is only there for a very brief duration, that is going to help you make sure that you don't get any motion from your subject in there. So if you can use a flash on your subject, that will really help you increase and improve your uh, tax sharp photos. All right, with number six, we, want, we mentioned before bokeh, but we want to say be careful with shallow depth of field. And this is particularly true for portraits. I know a lot of people really love their prime portrait lenses. I've got a Nikon 85 millimeter 1.4. And I was so excited to go try this out and take a photo. You're focusing on the eye. Well, the problem is if the eyes aren't on the same plane, so if your subject just turns a little bit to the left or the right, one eye is going to be in focus and the other one isn't. Yeah. And also uh, the face goes out of focus. Yeah. It, that when I see a person as a subject, I would see more than just the eye or even two eyes on the same plane. I, I don't want the lips to be out of focus. It's one of those things you want the area behind your subject maybe be out of focus. But just because you have a 1.4 lens doesn't necessarily mean that's that's the appropriate aperture to really capture your subject and, and make sure he or she is sharp. And, you know, think about it like if you see a baby photo, babies are soft and cuddly and cute, but damn it, you want them to be sharp. Yeah. You want to actually see the baby because if, you know, some of the eyes are out of focus or some of the other parts of the face are out of focus, it's not tack sharp and it's not a good presentation of your subject. That's not a portrait aperture. No, it, it really isn't. Now that said, there are some cases where prime lenses may be sharper than zooms. This is something that was particularly true in the past. With modern lenses, I think zooms can be as sharp as primes. I know for some of the lenses I get, like my Nikon 24 to 70 and 70 to 200, I trust those to be sharp just as much as I do my prime lenses. However, the kit lens that you get isn't necessarily going to be the sharpest glass that Nikon produces or Canon produces. Yeah. So the zoom lens there is not necessarily going to be the sharpest lens that you can get. So sometimes in, if you're looking for really tack sharp photos, gear matters. And getting a prime lens is a less expensive way of making sure that you've got the sharp lens. You can spend over $2,000, $2,500 on some of these lenses I mentioned, like the 24 to 70 and 70 to 200. Now, there's a question about focus. Some people think that autofocus is better. Some people think that manual focus is better. And what I've noticed is it depends upon your camera. And the lens. I can tell you with the lenses and my Nikon D800 that I shoot with, the autofocus is outstanding. It will do much better than I will do. I'm happy with the autofocus. I actually have my 50 millimeter prime, which is a very inexpensive lens. I prefer to use manual focus. I do not find that to be a remotely sharp lens. It, it's a nice, it's one of my favorite little lenses, but the possible, I like to use manual focus on that one, which means you need to be able to take your time to compose. The one drawback of manual focus for me is not being able to move your focus points. And depending where you are, it might you might not want the, the main focus to be on in the center. I was trying something last week and thought this is a major disadvantage and it forced me to use autofocus where manual focus for there would have probably suited me better. And Lee brings up a good point with the focus points. And I think this is something that you may want to also switch from having your shutter button half depressed to initiate an autofocus to a back button focus. On my D800, I've got it set. There's a little button back there that I can set for autofocus lock. And I prefer to separate the function of taking the photo and using autofocus. So that way I can get my focus on my subject's eye, but the composition I want may not have a focus point, you know, in that same area. Yeah, that, that's not for me. But you could do that with manual focus, though. Mm -hmm. You could do manual focus on the eye. So depending upon whether you're doing manual focus or autofocus and where you want the focus point to be, it's really going to depend upon your gear. And that's something I think is going to take a little bit of individual experimentation to find out work, what works best for you. Yeah. Just a few things to keep in mind. And finally, the last item we have is to sharpen in post-processing. Every photo needs sharpening. It's just the way it is. If you're shooting in RAW, it's applying no sharpening whatsoever. If you're shooting in JPEG, then your camera's doing some post-processing before it gives you the JPEG result. We're going to recommend shooting in RAW and then using your tools, whether it be Lightroom, Photoshop, or, or other tools to do your sharpening. But every photo needs some kind of sharpening to go with it. In Lightroom, there's a, there's a wonderful little feature. If you hold down 
on a Mac, it's the option button on the PC, it's the alt button. If you hold that down while you slide the masking slider in Lightroom for your sharpening, it'll turn it to black and white and then it will show you what your mask looks like. Yeah. And as you slide it more and more over to the right, it'll narrow down to just the edges and that white area with just the edges are the areas that you're sharpening. And that's really all you need to sharpen. Yeah. And it works for all the other sliders under that little section as well, as well as for the the, uh, the noise reduction. Those are our tips for tax sharp photos. We hope it helps you. If you've got some ideas or comments, please let us know. Thank you very much for listening to the Photo Flunky Show. Show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 81. And of course, there'll be a transcript of the show there for free. You can subscribe there on that page with links to iTunes, Google Play Music. Ooh, I can't say iTunes anymore. Now it's Apple Podcasts. They've changed the name. Whatever. Yeah, that's what I thought too. <laughs> I'm still calling it iTunes. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. We'll see you here again next week.